final speaker this evening is Peter Gordon. Between uh, 1980 and 2010, Peter worked as a lawyer with Slater and Gordon, serving as senior partner between 1995 and 2009. He's a former colleague of the Prime Minister, Julie Gillard, and Attorney General, Robert McClellan. In the course of conducting various class actions, Peter has been threatened with legal proceedings by James Hardy, CSR, the Australian Red Cross Society, the Catholic Church, and British American Tobacco. All of those cases were concerned with the suppression of information. This makes Peter eminently qualified to speak on WikiLeaks and free speech this evening. He's also asked me to say that uh, any resemblance between what he says and any living person is only apocryphal. Thank you, Spencer, and um, thank you all for being here tonight. Let me first of all say, um, at a personal level, that it gives me no pleasure at all to uh, stand up here tonight and make remarks which are critical of uh, one of my former colleagues and partners in Julia Gillard, um, a woman for whom I have a great deal of uh, admiration and uh, of whom I was immensely proud when she became Prime Minister and on the night that she finally rid us of the yoke of the Howard government. No pleasure at all. When something is wrong, it's wrong. And when the wrong thing is done by people who we've always believed have traditionally shared our values and our political aspirations, I think that our obligation is all the stronger to stand up and call it. And so that's why I'm here tonight. Several days ago, the Prime Minister said that she would not intervene in Julian Assange's legal obligations. She said that there was a difference between what Witty WikiLeaks had done and the moral force of a whistleblower, such as put Watergate into the public eye. Blowing the whistle on Watergate, she said, was something she could understand, but WikiLeaks was not about making a moral case. She said, quote, it's just putting out information and whatever happens, happens. It's an irresponsible thing to do. Watergate, of course, is the general description given to the unprecedented occurrence of the President of the United States engaging in a series of criminal acts to cover up the breaking into the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate building by some Republican thugs. One might first observe about this approach that if the benchmark for what seems to be becoming the term worthy whistleblowing is criminal or corrupt activity at the most senior level of the government of the United States, two things might inure from that. The first is that many of us might think that that's a pretty high benchmark. The second is, high benchmark as it is, haven't many of the WikiLeaks disclosures, at least in part, satisfied it anyway? One of the WikiLeaks revelations suggests that the United States government was colluding with a prosecutor in Spain who was trying to close down an independent investigation into the use of Spanish airports for transporting suspects to countries in which the US government carried out extraordinary rendition. According to the report in The Guardian, the US government was especially alarmed when magistrates and prosecutors in Spain began comparing notes on the case. US officials are quoted as saying, this coordination will complicate our efforts to manage this at a discreet government to government level. What possible crimes are involved there? Well, extraordinary rendition has arguably been shown in the past to involve murder, torture and kidnap. And communications between US and prosecution officials in any country, which led to other prosecutors being threatened or interfered with, in many jurisdictions would constitute the criminal offence of an attempt to pervert the course of justice. Now, are these crimes made out by these revelations? Of course not. Of course they are not. But neither was Watergate when the character known as Deep Throat first began to leak information to the journalist Woodward and Bernstein. No whistleblowing information ever reaches that standard when it's first released for the very reason that those impugned are entitled to the presumption of innocence and a fair trial. 
But imagine what might have happened if someone had said to Deep Throat, when those revelations about the criminal conduct of the President of the United States were first being communicated, you're just putting information out there. <laughs> well, what else has WikiLeaks disclosed? We've already heard a lot of them tonight. Some of the others that intrigued me were the fact that US military forces have been operating secretly inside Pakistan. That Pakistan has been responsible for a spate of extrajudicial killings and that the United States has decided to be complicit in the suppression of information about those killings. That while we're regularly told that the policy towards Afghanistan is as simple as it's needing to stay the course or not cut and run, whatever those things might mean, down on the ground in the Middle East, the Afghan Vice President, Ahmad Zia Massoud, was stopped in question in Dubai last year when he flew into the Emirate with $52 million in cash while back in Kabul, his boss Hamid Karzai has been accused by his own ministers of complicity in criminal activity, including that he had ordered the physical intimidation of the official in charge of leading the negotiations with the Taliban. Over in Saudi Arabia, courtesy of WikiLeaks, we can now um, read that the government there is the largest source of funds worldwide to Islamic terrorist groups. And back in Washington, the government is suspected of coordinating reprisals against WikiLeaks which include persuading Visa and MasterCard to cease payment services to WikiLeaks. This is a flagrant antitrust violation by those companies and by the government of the United States. Are they serious offences? Ask the Qantas executive doing time in a US federal prison. Of course they are. Let me reiterate that with respect to the information which has come out from WikiLeaks about each and every one of these examples, I don't know if they're true or capable of being made out in a criminal trial. But they are potentially very serious matters. And the last group of people who ought to be telling us whether we have the right to know about them are the very politicians who might be accountable in respect of them. The point's been made that the demonisation of Julian Assange and the information WikiLeaks has disclosed is almost totally unsupported, in fact it is totally unsupported by the publication so far of any material which might credibly be said to constitute a breach of national security or of anyone's any country's national interest as opposed to the personal interest of politicians. It's also important I think to stress that the Prime Minister's formulation of what constitutes a sufficient calumny to justify publication, that is to say the Watergate standard, is not the legal position in Australia any more than it is sensible public policy. In Australia, provided the publisher of the material has not themselves been involved in criminal activity to obtain the information, there's no criminal sanction involved. And even at a civil standard, the most that could be argued is that there may be an equitable obligation of confidence. But even that equitable obligation of confidence will be of no protection if the material is capable of showing that a prima facie case of some wrongdoing might be able to be proved down the track. Which of the examples I've referred you to would not meet that test? It's become difficult to identify which is the most important issue to protest in relation to the staggering exhibitions of abuse of power to which we've been subject in the last weeks of last year, almost on a daily basis. At first, my principal concern about this case was the brazen use of money and power by big government and big corporations to deny information. And as I stand here today, two months down the track from when we, the Law Institute had its first meeting about this, a couple of months ago, I'm even more bemused by what could possibly have led decent politicians like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama to so compromise the democratic principles which have otherwise been so fundamental to their lives and their career. The sight of these most prominent politicians in our own country in the United States threatening the use and the abuse of criminal law to punish a man who republished information which was already publicly available and had for some time been accessible to at least three million people is deeply disturbing. We should all reflect on how any individual would cope with that. The actions and the pronouncement of the US government in its broader iterations, including the references to Huckabee in, um, in late last year, are downright disgraceful. The pressure which has led to PayPal, Visa and MasterCard being gang-pressed into secondary boycotts of WikiLeaks, it's frightening. It's too hard to access and to legitimately use information in this country. 
As Chris, as Chris Warren has said, freedom of information laws, albeit there's been some improvement at a federal level, they've become a board game for powerful politicians and their public service. And promises of whistleblower protection that various politicians have made are more honoured in their absence. It's easy for politicians to make big claims of support for whistleblowers in the abstract. It's when whistleblowers like Julian Assange and WikiLeaks are publishing genuinely troubling information about our own governments that, to quote our former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, is when the rubber hits the road. <laughs> we need a legislative regime which genuinely supports whistleblowers, provides them proper legal representation, permits a person to make an ex parte that's an application by himself to a judge, show the judge the documents, and if the judge is of the view that legitimate issues of public concern are enlivened, the information should be disclosed, whatever the source of the document. Too often in recent years, vacuous claims of national interest, national security, legal privilege, confidentiality, commercial incompetence, diplomacy have marked a much more cynical and sinister motive for keeping information secret. It's time. I'd like to conclude by saying that, as I mentioned at a previous forum on this topic, I know Julia Gillard and I know Rob McClelland. I've worked with both of them. They've been good lawyers and they're decent people. The positions of power can lead them to act in a way in which has been described tonight and the comments which have been made by each of them in the last three months is a salutary lesson to all of us and should be of deep concern. While it's true that the initial allegations of illegality by McClelland and by the Prime Minister have not been repeated recently, in my opinion, the circumstances do call for our government to reaffirm, in the specific context of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, the primacy of freedom of speech, the presumption of innocence, the protection of the rights of Australians overseas. Thank you very much.